This is Duke University. Uh, this is just such an opportunity to have him talk to you about the work that he's been doing. And I can't resist a little walk down memory lane in introducing him. So I was asking him, what was the first year we met? And you said it was 1981? in first year criminal law, which is probably in one of these big classes. And then uh, he took federal criminal law. He worked for me um, at that time. If you taught a small section, you also taught writing. He was helping me mark student papers for first year criminal law for the writing. And uh, I was privileged to also see him uh, perform in the Moot Court Board. And in fact, I was looking on the firm website. I'd forgotten that he won the Best Brief Award in the Dean's Cup. So next Monday is the Dean's Cup. And uh, we had it even way back then. I remember sitting with you and your wife at a dinner for that. And uh, he's a very distinguished student. At the same time uh, that he got his uh, law degree, he was also getting a uh, master's in public policy. And that was at a time when not so many people got joint degrees. It really was not a joint degree. I got two different things. Uh-huh. All right. Well, you just wanted to do it the hard way, right? I don't think we'd figured out how to do them uh, jointly. And his thesis was on the supply and demand for lawyers. Boy, was he ahead of the game in thinking about that. Um, and uh, uh, after leaving law school, he did a clerkship, but he also did something else that's much more unusual for our students. He went into the Peace Corps. He and his wife went into the Peace Corps. And I think you were kind of an add-on. I think her skills were uh, in a little higher demand in Africa. And uh, he's had, uh, since returning to the United States from that youthful uh, excursion, uh, an extremely uh, distinguished career in the Bradley Arendt Law Firm, which is a very large firm and well-known firm in Birmingham, Alabama. He's the chair of their financial services and insurance litigation group. And from my point of view, more importantly, he's the chair, co-chair of their pro bono group. He's a guy with an active family life and uh, a very, very active practice life um, who also has carved out uh, a tremendous amount of time to do public service work. And what he's going to talk to you today uh, about is this uh, saga, this 14-year uh, slog of uh, representing a defendant in a death row case. So um, I think not only is he going to talk to you about the sort of skills and the experience of litigating that, um, but he's going to, I hope, talk a little bit about what it meant to be doing that kind of work and, and how you balance these things uh, in life. And I'm looking at all of you, how you remember your law school right? and come back and want to talk to students, uh, stay in touch with your faculty members. You don't forget. I love getting Christmas cards. He's got really good looking kids, uh -huh. one of whom we're going to have dinner with uh, tonight. So I, I just, it's a complete package. It's just such a thrill uh, for me to be able to welcome him back to the podium. So I hope you will join me in welcoming him up here, and then uh, we'll all learn a lot from what he's got to say. All right, I'm going to talk about several different things all together. And so part of it is, is really this post-conviction case where I was representing Victor Ramar Stevens uh, after he had been sentenced to death. Uh, I'm also going to talk some just generally about pro bono work and, and also about being a lawyer and how all that fits together. And I, I, before I start, though, I do want to say something because some of my comments could be taken out of context and sound critical of perhaps of some individuals who I'm not particularly meaning to name, but you could back into who they were. And so, for example, the judge who handled the state-level habeas corpus proceeding here was Judge Miggs. And I, I will tell you that he is an excellent judge. He was as fair as he could have been. He ruled against my client. Um, but I felt like we got a, a, as fair of a shake from him as we could have under the circumstances. You know, the current attorney general is Luther Strange. He used to be one of my partners. And some of the things I'm saying will be sound critical of the, the prosecutors and the attorney general's office. And I will tell you that there's been a real change since he became attorney general. And some of the types of things that I'm talking about are not the normal practice now. Um, Clay Crenshaw, who is somebody who has been in charge of the capital litigation unit for the attorney general's office for uh, as long as I've been doing this, is actually an excellent lawyer. Um, I wish that he wasn't dedicated to the things that he is, but he does a very good job representing the state, um, opposing people who are doing what I'm doing, which is trying to have the death sentences removed from the people who have been sentenced to death in Alabama. 
So I, I do want to, before I started, I wanted to make clear that, you know, what happens is that people sometimes get in the system and there's so much work to do that they end up getting process oriented and they sort of forget the big picture and the idea that when you're a prosecutor or you're with, you know, the, the attorney general's office, that your goal really should be justice and not a conviction. And you'll see some of the things that I'm talking about, how some of the people lost their perspective on those kinds of issues. Um, now, just before I go into that, uh, I'm with a big firm, and we've got a lawyer handbook with policies and procedures in it. Uh, we've got over 200 lawyers in Birmingham. We've got 100 lawyers in Nashville. We've got other offices. And the manual that we have for the lawyers has got a whole section on the pro bono program. And uh, I'm a co-chair of the pro bono committee, and what we do is our firm is committed to using 3% of our hours, our working hours, on pro bono matters. And so uh, we, we some, some years are a little shy of that, but that's our objective, to have 3% of our billable hours devoted to pro bono matters. And in, in recognition of the type of work that we should be doing, for the most part, that's representing those who are indigent. And so we have a formal policy where we have committed ourselves to uh, representing people who, who have a need for legal services that cannot afford it. Now, we, we have uh, a number of post-conviction death penalty cases that we're working on. We, another big cons time consumer in that regard is prisoner abuse cases. I could tell you stories about prisoner abuse that would make your stomach turn. And we've represented prisoners in some of those cases. We also, this, most places have some version of a volunteer lawyers program where people who need legal services come. We participate in the Birmingham Volunteer Lawyers Program. Our Jackson offices participates in the one there, and our Nashville office participates in the one there. And a lot of people, that's how they do their pro bono work. Our estate and planning lawyers do wills for heroes. And so both for military and first responders, you know, police and firemen, they'll do wills for free. And they'll set up a day where anybody that's one, in one of those categories can come and they'll do the uh, estate planning, the advanced directives, those kinds of things that somebody in that would need. We have clinics and we also just have people who represent individuals. When you're thinking about where you're going to work, one of the factors I urge you to think about and ask people when you're, when you're interviewing is, tell me about your pro bono program. I'm just telling you it's a, it will tell you something about the firm culture. You know, is it a dog eat dog, everybody only takes home what they kill kind of place? Or is there some kind of culture there where they, they recognize that there are other things that are worth doing in life? And if, if the firm has a pro bono program, that will probably tell you that they have other values besides, you know, let's just make as much money as we can and go home. All right. Um, now, part of the problem with the death penalty in Alabama is the judicial override. And so uh, there's a, a gurney there. You know, they don't electrocute people anymore. They use lethal injection. Um, most people have the misperception that when they do lethal injection to somebody, they just put them to sleep. That's not correct. That's not what they do. They actually give them a short-acting barbiturate, and then they give them a drug that makes their heart stop. Now, the drug that they give people who are being um, executed that makes their heart stop also makes their muscles shake. And in order so that the people watching it think that it's a peaceful experience, there's actually a second drug that's given to them that paralyzes the person so that they don't shake before they're given the third drug that then makes their heart stop. So, you know, the idea is, is that lethal injection, surely that's more humane. The method that's used for lethal injection in every state in the United States is a method that veterinarians are prohibited from using to euthanize an animal. All right? So just, you know, kind of thing that, you know, public doesn't know those kind of things. And it's just, it's, it's something that you, until you get into this process and you start learning something um, you don't know about. Now, uh, this is the executive summary of that same sort of uh, brochure from the Equal Justice Initiative of Alabama that I showed you with the picture of the gurney on it. Um, just a couple of facts from there. Um, of the 34 states with the death penalty, Alabama is the only jurisdiction where judges routinely override jury verdicts of life to impose capital punishment. Delaware and Florida also have the same law where a judge can possibly override a jury. Florida has not done it in 12 years. 
Delaware has not done it in 20 years. In Alabama, it happens frequently. Since 1976, Alabama judges have overridden jury verdicts 107 times. Of those 107 times, nine of them were times where the jury recommended death and the judge sentenced them to life without parole. The 98 others, the, ju the jury recommended life without parole and the elected judges sentenced them to death. 21% of the 199 people currently on Alabama's death row were sentenced to death through a judicial override. Now, um, Alabama has the highest per capita death row population in the country. Double Florida, six times Texas. You think, of, you think of the death penalty, people think Texas, right? Well, Texas is a much bigger state, and both because of the size of the state, they've got more people, and the publicity that comes from when they actually execute somebody. But every year for the last several years, Alabama, even though it's a seventh the size of Texas, has executed more people than Texas. One of the problems in Alabama is both the trial and the appellate judges are elected. And judicial candidates frequently campaign on how tough they are on crime. And uh, as a matter of fact, the judge who overrode the sentence for Victor Stevens was actually running for the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals, the intermediate level appellate court in Alabama, when he sentenced Victor Stevens to death and then used how many people he had sentenced to death in his campaign literature. Um, another point that is uh, surprising to people is that before you actually even impanel a jury in a death penalty case, they what they do they what they call death qualify the jury. So anybody who has qualms about the death penalty is removed from the jury pool before they strike start striking the jury. All right. So recognize that. You, you take out the people who are most likely to find any criminal defendant not guilty, and you, find, you take out the people who are not going to be in favor of the death penalty. And so despite the fact that the juries are death qualified before they even start striking the jury, you still have these judicial overrides of juries who are um, recommending that people serve life without parole instead of a death sentence. And so again, um, it's just a graphic coming out of the same brochure that I've been sort of flipping through. Uh, and th the point is, is that it was 40, 41, it's now 40, all right, because Victor Stevens has been removed from death row. Now, one of the factors that is also hard to understand, and I'm assuming that if y'all take criminal law, this may be something that you actually have studied, is Ring Against Arizona. In Ring against Arizona, the U.S. Supreme Court said that the fact findings underlying a death sentence must be made by a jury. Uh, in Alabama, that has not worked its way through the appellate process yet. And the reason why is that Ring against Arizona is not retroactive. So someone like Victor Stevens, who was sentenced to death in 1987, does not get to claim a, have a Ring claim because the, the opinion is not retroactive, so it's only moving forward. And there haven't, hasn't been anybody who's had the right set of facts to challenge the Alabama death sentencing statute, and so we are still at a situation where um, in Alabama we've got these overrides instead of having uh, the jury recommendation followed. Now, this is just a list of the gentlemen who, and they are all gentlemen, who are on death row today in Alabama because uh, of a judicial override. And it's, it's really, it's, if you just start realizing that these people have names, Gregory Akers, Andrew Pacella, Michael Barnes, it, it drives home to the fact that these, this is, there's something more going on. Now, this, is, this shows all the way to the, almost to the end of the list. Victor Stevens was convicted in Hale County uh, judge Charles Thigpen was the judge who overrode the verdict. The, the sentence was in 1989. The crime was in 1986. The sentence was um, not until 1989. Uh, the BWB there is an indication of the race. The B, the first B is Victor Stevens' race, and then the W and the B are the race of the victims. Um, usually when you have a judicial override, you have got 
a black person who's been convicted and you have a white victim. Now, just stepping just an aside here, this is a list of the death row inmates that are clients of my firm. Um, Victor Stevens was awarded a new trial in October, so he is technically not on death row right now. Uh, there are a couple, there's one person on this list, John M. Nixon, who was actually executed. We've had two people that are on this list who um, have uh, died while they were in prison for health reasons, and we've had one person who was removed because of his age. He was uh, 17 when the crime committed, and the U.S. Supreme Court has, since he was sentenced to death, ruled that you cannot sentence to death, um, sentence a minor to death. Now, uh, Victor Stevens, if you'll notice, I have Mudge Rose written on there. I suspect that um, y none of y'all are old enough to know who Mudge Rose what the Mudge Rose Law Firm was. Only one of us, I think, do. Well, two, since I do. <laughs> Maybe some others might. Uh, Richard Nixon and John Mitchell. Uh, that's the Richard Nixon, who is a Duke Law alumni and was one of the presidents of the United States, was a partner in Mudge Rose. John Mitchell, who was his attorney general, was also had been a partner in Mudge Rose. Now, interesting, to some extent, that had a an impact on this case. Um, after the, the Watergate scandal, the Mudge Rose firm really never fully recovered. But there, there were people there who stayed, but they just didn't bring in the young lawyers. There was problems for the firm. And in 1994, the firm disbanded. It completely dissolved. Well, in 1992, three lawyers from the Mudge Rose firm started representing Victor Stevens in his post-conviction challenges to his conviction and sentence. I actually was asked in 1992 by the managing partner in my firm to help them. And I, I did not appear as counsel of record. I was just getting subpoenas served and just things of that nature. Well, um, nothing happened in the case for years. Uh, January 1997, I get a call from the older of the three lawyers who was not even on the pleadings. The two younger lawyers were on the pleadings, and he tells me that the two younger lawyers are no longer in the United States, and there's a hearing coming up. Can I go with him? And so I agree. Um, I, you know, in 1992, I was an associate. By 1997, I was now a young partner. And so I think that I'm driving down to Hale County to have a hearing where there's going to be a status hearing, and this, this New York lawyer, who's now with another big firm because Mudge Rose doesn't exist, is going to find other lawyers, and I'm just showing him where the courthouse is. Well, the judge wants to have the state habeas corpus hearing, the Rule 32 hearing, that day. And Victor Stevens is there. I meet him that day. And uh, we convince the judge that if, if he will allow me to make an appearance, he gives us two months, and so we actually have the hearing two months later than that first hearing where I even showed up representing Victor Stevens. Um, as you might guess, Hale County is uh, a very rural Alabama county. It's got a population of about 15,000 people. Um, everybody knows everybody. And so here I am. You know, in Hale County, they consider people from Birmingham to be Yankees, foreigners, okay? <laughs> um, so here I am. I'm going into Hale County representing this convict, death row inmate, who everybody knows the two people that he murdered. And um, that's, now, in addition to that, this is the confession, one of the three confessions by Victor Stevens that was actually read uh, at the trial. And um, normally, all right, normally, I'm going to step aside just a second. I use this same presentation software that I've been using here when I'm in trial or if I have a big motion hearing, and I normally have a technical person who, as I talk, they do the things that I'm going to stop and sort of pull up and sort of expand for y'all. But I, and it's going to slow me down a little bit, but I wanted y'all to know what I was doing here. All right, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read for y'all one of Victor Stevens's confessions so you have some idea about what the crime was and what he was, what he had confessed to doing. And so, uh, this is exhibit number 73 at his 1987 trial. Uh, Mr. Green is the lead prosecutor. He is an assistant district attorney prosecuting the case, and he's got a uh, sheriff's deputy who took this confession from Victor Stevens, who he's examining and who's getting to read the confession. So 
the, the prosecutor asked, if you would, sir, read the statement to the jury, beginning with a paragraph that begins with a narration of events, leaving out the introductory matters. And then this quote is quoting Victor Stevens, what he actually wrote in his own handwriting. We went to New Orleans on Saturday night or early Sunday morning, the 18th or 19th. This is the first time I'd been to Louisiana with Peabody Starks. We left Louisiana early Monday morning, January 19th, 1986. We came up the interstate and turned off the interstate after we crossed into Alabama. After we came across a long bridge in Alabama, Peabody kept saying we need some money. After we crossed the bridge, we pulled over to the store to get gas. Peabody said he needed some money. I told him I had enough money to get us home. We pulled up to the gas pumps. A white man came out and pumped us $10 worth of gas. I asked the man, If he had a bathroom and he said no. I got back in the truck and smoked a cigarette. Peabody went into the store. He stayed in the store a long time and I walked up to the store and opened the door. Then this white man shot me in the hand. I fell to my knees and pulled my gun, 25 caliber automatic, out of my right rear pocket and started shooting. I don't even know if I shot anybody or not. The white man was standing to my left. And there was also a black man who was in the store. They were both, one of them was 72, the other one was 83. Um, the white man was standing to my left when he shot me with a shotgun. Peabody came running by me yelling, let's go, let's go. We ran out and jumped in the truck. I didn't make it in time. Going down the road, Peabody asked me where my gun was. I told him I left it at the store. He said, you really, and some French word I don't recognize, us up this time. I kept telling Peabody I was hurt, take me to the hospital, and he wouldn't do it. He gave me some gin and some rags to wrap my hand, and then I lay down and went to sleep. After we got back to Georgia, Peabody took me by Charlie Dallas's house. Dallas took me to the hospital in Bowden, Georgia. At the hospital, I told my mother to get my coat, and she did. She also got some money, about $30 to $40, out of my coat pocket, signed Victor Stevens. Now, Victor Stevens was told that if he didn't sign a confession, they were not going to give him any medical treatment. He did have three confessions. He didn't get any medical treatment. He had his, uh, he tried, you know, his lawyer did try to suppress his confessions, but all three of them were read at the trial. Now, they found Victor Stevens' gun at the scene. They found food stamps from the store in the truck, that Peabody Starks, who was also tried just right after Victor Stevens was, in Peabody Starks' truck. They found Victor Stevens' wallet in Peabody Starks' truck. They found food stamps in Victor Stevens' Uh, wallet. You can trace the food stamps to the store where they were negotiated. All right? So in, they found Victor Stevens' blood at the scene. In spite of all of this evidence, rather than, than trying to have Victor Stevens convicted on a lesser offense, his lawyer tried to have a mistaken identity defense. Tried to find that Victor Stevens had not been there. Now, part of the reason why that makes no sense is that Victor Stevens had another robbery conviction from October 2007, and this trial was in December 2007. From his October conviction, he already had a life without parole sentence. So the only thing that could happen to Victor Stevens that would be worse than the sentence that he already had would be a death sentence. So dis despite that, his lawyer tried to have a mistaken identity defense in, in face of the fact that there was no further punishment other than death that he could be uh, imposed on him and in spite of the fact of all the evidence that he had in front of him. Um, as you can see, there are some questions about whether or not the lawyers that, that death row inmates have provide adequate legal representation. Now, this is uh, the scene. Uh, this is a diagram that was actually used at the scene. And the convenience store is really small. I've, I've actually been to it. It's, it's, it was closed, actually, by the time I got involved in the case. But if you will look, to some extent, the body that's drawn, you think of that as being a six-foot man, do you see how much of the floor space it takes up? So this is a really small convenience store. And um, to the, the body is the circle is the head. He's actually holding the shotgun. And um, if y'all can sort of follow my pointer right here, this is the front door. And, and there's a glass door. Victor Stevens was standing right here. The, 
this man was standing here, Christopher Starks was standing here, and I'm basing this on my summary of multiple sources, okay? And so Christopher Starks is sitting here getting money out of the cash register, holding a gun, pointing it at the store owner who's standing here with a shotgun in his hand, and Victor Stevens walks in. The man had pumped gas for him, so he knew the two were together. Whether he intended to shoot Victor Stevens or not, um, he shoots Victor Stevens with his sawed-off shotgun. What I understand is that he was reloading it, and Victor Stevens starts shooting with the good hand that he has that's left. Now, the first x-ray that was taken of Victor Stevens' hand was after I got involved for the, the state habeas corpus proceeding, and this is very, it's very hard to Xerox an x-ray, but that's what this is. Who can guess what those little dots are in the, around that hand? That's, that's number eight shotgun pellets. All right, just sort of to this part right here that I'm blowing up, 7897 is uh, July 8th, 1997, right before our Rule 32 hearing. And then over here it says Stevens Victor, um, Alabama Department of Corrections. So here's, you've got someone who's had all these shotgun pellets in his hand, and the first time anyone takes an x-ray of it is 10 years after his trial. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about has to do with the jury selection, because that is the ground on which Victor Stevens has been awarded a new trial. And this is the jury list. And this is someone who, someone's copy of the jury list, and they've crossed off names as people were removed from the jury. The names actually that are hard crossed, the ones that you can sort of tell was done by a felt tip, those are the people who were removed primarily as they were death qualifying the jury. And so the jury went from being 60% um, white, I mean 60% black to being 40% uh, black through the death qualifying process of the jury. Um, This is just a, another page in the same list. You can see they originally had 106 jurors. When they started striking, they only had 57 left. Most of those had left during the process of death qualifying the jury, but some of them had excuses. In other words, they couldn't be there for some, some reason. So, but a, a little over half of them I, seemed to be removed um, for cause because of the, the fact that this was a death penalty case. Now, the numbers that you see along here at the bottom, um, Blow this up so y'all can see it. All right, y'all see how I blew that up? Now, if I'm in trial and there's a particular language out of a contract or something that I want the witness to look at, okay, but there is the same thing. All right, um, these numbers correlate with the numbers that are next to the jurors' names. Um, this was a P and it was overwritten with an S, and those numbers all the way across Every one of them, all the way to number 21, are blacks. The state struck 21 blacks in a row. Their 22nd strike, which unfortunately is just a copying problem with this only version that I still have of the strike, this part of the strike sheet, but I have the information like in the record itself. But the, they did strike a white person with their 22nd strike. And then their alternate strike also struck a white person. So depending on how you count it, 21 out of 22 regular strikes or 21 out of 23 strikes, the state struck blacks. Um, if you'll notice the number 100, uh, well the numbers there correlate, so um, number 39, which is the last one um, under 21 there, is Sarah Harris. And you'll hear her name again, I just, just if you will, remember Sarah Harris's name. All right, now, the state had available to it the, the names ahead of time, and they had created, this is work product that I actually got during the Rule 32 hearing, this, this is the district attorney's office's work product where they had gone and they had already done some investigation on people and then a lot of this, uh, the typed part is the investigation they had done before the trial and then the handwritten part is somebody's um, handwritten notes. The name at the very top there is Roy Johnson, he was the district attorney, so these are the district attorney's handwritten notes that we're looking at, but Ed Green also had these exact same sheets and had different handwritten notes on his sheets, all right? Um, and if you'll notice, the, they've got up there the demographics. Uh, I'll show you again, but they've, they've got demographics on the people. 
But the, the thing that I want you to see on Roy Johnson's sheet is this page right here. Um, sort of hard to see right now, but I'm going to try to... Let me, let me get you a page where I've already blown it up some. All right. So we've got Willie Nell Shelton and Minnie P. Prince, and they've got some handwriting next to their name. And if you go and you blow that up so that you can see it better, I don't know if you can read that, but it says, need reason to strike. Now, you're supposed to use actual reasons. You're not supposed to use pretextual reasons. That's the whole purpose behind the Batson process. Um, so would you guess how many whites do you think had need reason to strike written by their name? All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to move to the strike sheets of Ed Green. And Ed Green was the Batson spokesperson. So Victor Stevens' lawyer made a good Batson argument, made a motion, got it to the stage where the, uh, the state had to justify the strikes that it had made. And so they gave race-neutral reasons for all the strikes. Now, this is, this is Ed Green, the Batson spokesperson's strike sheet. Um, now... On his strike sheets, do you see the S that's written over here on the left side? Um, there were two different types of S's that were written. There were S's that were written, and you can tell from looking on the original better than you can tell on these copies that have been copied several times, that was written in ballpoint pen with a circle around it. Then those S's were drawn before they death qualified the jury. After they death qualified the jury and, and others had been removed for cause, then there were marks made with a felt tip pen. And so, uh, Kerry Nell Ball is somebody who he thought he w had an S written next to her name, and he did it once with a, with a uh, ballpoint pen, and a second time he did the same thing with a felt tip pen later. Uh, Curtis Ball is another person, and that person only had the felt tip writing next to his name. Now, here is Sarah Harris. She's juror number 39, and she was their last strike. Notice she has OK written next to her name. And notice that Lilia Hayes, juror number 40, also has OK written next to her name, and 40 was the next to last strike. Here's just another example. Um, here's Gracie Lewis with an S written next to her name. And Joseph Lewis, if you see the cross out through his name, he was somebody that was removed for cause at the beginning of the part of the jury selection process, and so he only had a uh, ballpoint S next to his name. Now, um, sort of hard to follow all these S's and to make sense of it. Uh, how many of y'all have taken evidence? How, do you, how many of you recognize Rule 1006 and what it allows you to do? Well, rule 1006 allows you to create demonstrative exhibits that summarize the information that you have from other exhibits. This is a demonstrative exhibit. All right, so there we see Carrie Nell Ball. She was marked with an S with a circle, and she was struck by the state. She was also marked with a black felt tip S. Slipped, slipped down to number three. You see, he was marked with an S with a circle, and he was excused by the trial court. So you can, you can show what happened to each one of these jurors all the way through by the ones that were excused by the trial court, none of them had a felt tip mark next to them. So it's apparent, and Ed Green actually admitted when I took his deposition that what he had done is he had used a ballpoint pen, marked S's next to people's names, and then um, later had put a, used a felt tip pen and marked S or OK by people's names at that point. Um, at deposition, Mr. Green admitted that putting an S next to somebody's name meant that's somebody I don't think much of and I'm going to strike. And that's what happened to all the ones that you see with an S next to their name with a felt tip. Now, three of the jurors, Sarah Lee Harris, Lilia Hayes, and Melania Hobson, were struck by the state even though they had an OK written by their name. The last three state strikes were Ms. Harris, Ms. Hayes, and Ms. Hobson. Guess how many white jurors had an S or an OK written by their name? None. None.
All right, just sort of going and uh, sort of trying to stay in chronological order a little bit. Um, this is a newspaper article um, about the conviction of Peabody Starks, Christopher Peabody Starks, who was uh, the other person who was in the store with Victor Stevens. Now, uh, as quoted here in this paper, okay, Deputy District Attorney Ed Green said Thursday, Starks claimed he did not shoot either man, but his 32 caliber pistol was the one which was used to kill Bailey. Green said Starks maintained Stevens, 25, had used two guns and fired both with both hands when he entered the store. And then this is supposed to be a quote from Ed Green. It's doubtful he, Stevens, could have done that because he already had been shot in one hand, Green said Thursday afternoon. Well, what Ed Green is saying is consistent with what Victor Stevens' confessions were. And uh, I want you all to remember that. We'll come back to it in just a second. Now, this is the sentencing order. Uh, Victor Stevens was, was um, convicted in January 1987. It took him until July 1989 to sentence him. Uh, the election was in November 1989 where Judge Thigpen was running for the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, now, some of y'all might be able to read this already, but I'm going to blow this part up. Dear Judge, Judge Thigpen, enclosed the proposed sentencing orders for Monday. Jim. All right. Um, Victor Stevens' counsel was not served with this sentencing order. So, the judge entered a sentencing order that the, that the district attorney drafted on an ex parte basis. Now, interesting, they went to the trouble, the judge's secretary down right below, you see that handwriting? I'm pretty sure that must have been the judge's secretary, but anyway, it says received by judge 72189. So the day after the correspondence coming on the district attorney's um, letterhead. Now, what happened is that after I became involved in the case, I didn't have any pleadings. I didn't have anything. So I went down to Hale County to get the pleadings out of storage and to look at them. And stuck in the file jacket was this letter with an unsigned copy of the sentencing order attached to it. Um, in addition, at the same time, there were uh, six envelopes in there, all unopened, and two envelopes that had been opened, all addressed to the New York lawyers who had been representing Victor Stevens before I got involved thoroughly, while I was just sort of helping them serve subpoenas and stuff. And so the reason why you went from 92 to 97 with nothing happened is once a year, after Mudge Rose dissolved, they would send correspondence up to Mudge Rose, and it would return unopened. Now, how many of y'all are familiar with Corey Maples v. Thomas? against Thomas, the new U.S. Supreme Court case. Victor Stevens almost had the same thing happen to him because Mudge Rose had dissolved. Hale County was sending correspondence up there. I have to give the clerk in Hale County credit because what she did is she went and, and figured out where the law firm was. She figured out Tom Evans, who had been the managing partner of the firm, what firm he had gone to, and called him. He is the 73-year-old man that called me that then went down to Hale County with me. So I give the Hale County clerk a lot of credit for having run down somebody who would represent Victor Stevens rather than just doing what the clerk did in the Corey Maples situation. All right? So um, now the, the file stamp thing down here is dated 1998. So the first time that... Uh, this actually became part of the official record was when the denial of the Rule 32 hearing, the state court habeas corpus occurred, and then the clerk made it a copy, part of the record at that point in time. You can't see at the bottom, but there's an exhibit sticker at the bottom. That exhibit sticker is Defendant's Exhibit 10. I offered this as an exhibit during the Rule 32 hearing, and the judge excluded it. Well, Part of the problem you have is if you're representing somebody in a state habeas corpus proceeding, the record that you create then is the entire record that the federal court can use. With very rare exceptions, you cannot introduce evidence at a federal habeas corpus proceedings because of the AEDPA, the, the um, American Effective Death Penalty Act, I think, or something like that, which makes it so hard in federal habeas corpus proceedings now. Well, um, I proffered 
The judge excluded it, so I proffered this exact same exhibit. So when we got to federal court, it was in the record as a proffered exhibit that the judge had excluded, but it was on the record, and you can go back and read the Rule 32 hearing proceeding, and you can understand why it was offered at that time. Um, I was trying also to have sort of a due process type of argument, you know, that you've got these ex parte sentencing orders, you've got um, uh, other things like that where the, you know, the state's using the criminal justice system to come up with what people's prior convictions are, that information wasn't available to him, sort of to build up a whole body of things. And uh, anyway, now, this is the sentencing order itself. All right, now, something I almost always do that I did do here, um, I almost always take my, my cell phone, take it out of my pocket, and leave it at the council table so if it rings like mine just did, I don't, I don't answer it. And I advise you to do that as a regular, <laughs> as a regular practice. All right. Um, Here's the sentencing order. These are fact findings that are made. Actually, the prior page um, talks about the fact that these are findings that the judge is making beyond a reasonable doubt. And so the examination of the store revealed that Mr. Bailey was robbed of money and food stamps, and Mr. Bailey fi fired his 20-gauge shotgun at the intruders. Adam Pickens was unarmed. Mr. Bailey was found dead in the middle of the store, still clutching his shotgun. Mr. Bailey had apparently been shot in a different location inside the store as there was a trail of blood leading to the Bailey's body. Further examination to the scene revealed that one individual, later named to be the defendant, Victor Stevens, had been hit by the shotgun as blood was found near the front door together with a 25 caliber automatic pistol. A number eight shotgun pellet was removed from the barrel of the gun. All right, skipping over with some other fact, fact findings. Actually, let me skip to the next one. Statements made by the defendant that he only fired after Bailey fired at him with a shotgun are totally false and unworthy of belief. Forensic evidence revealed that an eight, a number eight shot pellet was removed from the barrel of the 25 caliber automatic pistol. The defendant admitted emptying his weapon. Obviously, the defendant emptied his pistol before Mr. Bailey fired his single shot 20 gauge shotgun. These 25 caliber bullets were recovered in the cash register as well as the bodies of both Bailey and Pickens. All right, to suggest, as defendant has, that he fired in self-defense is completely beyond comprehension. All right, so the state of Alabama's position in all of the challenges to ring is that the trial judge doesn't make fact findings. The trial judge does not determine the credibility of the witnesses. He just takes the fact findings that are already made by the jury. You, you read the sentencing order, and the judge is making the fact finding that Victor Stevens' confessions are false because he must have fired first, even though the same person who drafted that sentencing order was quoted in the newspaper as saying that Christopher Stark's story couldn't be true because Victor Stevens was shot in the hand uh, before, he, before he was um, was shot in the hand before he started firing. All right. Uh, that's Judge Thigpen, judge of the circuit court from the 4th Judicial District, and then it, the sentencing order is dated July 24th, 1989, uh, three days after he received the order from the district attorney's office. All right. This is um, the opinion from the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals after Victor Stevens' initial conviction. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of skip through a lot of this, um, but there's a quote in here it was easier for me to pull it out of the opinion that was relied on by the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals as it's one of its primary reasons for rejecting the Batson challenge on appeal, on direct appeal. And so the court, this would be Judge Thigpen, is it your testimony as an officer of this court that the reasons for striking were non-racial and not based upon the race of any particular juror? Mr. Green, it is your honor. Now, as part of the investigation that the New York lawyers had done and challenging Victor Stevens' conviction, they took an affidavit from Peabody Starks. And uh, in that affidavit, and I'm, I'm going to skip some of this just for some time, 
But um, paragraph four, Victor Stevens was no way involved either in the planning, planning or commission of this robbery. At the time, paragraph five, at the time I pulled into the Bailey's grocery store, Victor was asleep in the passenger seat of my pickup truck. I went into the grocery store alone with the intent to commit the robbery. During the robbery, Victor entered the store. Mr. Bailey lifted his shotgun and shot Victor in the left hand. I then shot Mr. Bailey. Now, the next paragraph, I'm not sure if, if that's correct, but that's, that apparently was Mr. Starks' understanding. When Victor Stevens entered the store, he was completely unaware that I was committing a robbery. All right, so you can see that the, the findings that were made in the sentencing order are being, were going to be attacked at the Rule 32 hearing. Well, before um, the Rule 32 hearing, some of uh, Peabody Starks' relatives talked to him. I interviewed him right before the 1997 uh, Rule 32 hearing, and he flipped. And at that point, he went back to his story that Victor Stevens went into the store with two guns in his hand and that uh, he had not been involved in the robbery in any way. And so um, we were unable to, to use his, his testimony at the Rule 32 hearing and had to rely on something else. This is the um, amended and, and restated writ for habeas corpus that was filed in 2001 in federal court. And uh, we, we litigated for a while in federal court. We did not have any discovery or any evidentiary proceedings. Uh, the litigation that we were having in federal court at this time had to do with lethal injection. In the interim, uh, Alabama had changed from electrocution to lethal injection as the method of execution. And so Victor Stevens wrote, brought a challenge to lethal injection as it occurred. I could spend 30 minutes talking about lethal injection, and I'm not going to do that. But for that reason, Victor Stevens had a second um, Rule 32 petition that was filed. And in that second Rule 32 petition, um, he was challenging lethal injection. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff. Uh, This is going to laying, this part here, the state pellet in the belt barrel argument. The, the reason that that was characterized on behalf of Victor Stevens is the state's argument is the first time that appeared was in the sentencing order. And the sentencing order then had been drafted by the state. And so the image that we were trying to create was that the prosecutor and the judge were all sort of working together. And so the state, um, came up with this pellet in the barrel argument to find that Victor Stevens's confessions couldn't be correct and to use that as a reason to override the jury recommendation of life without parole. Um, now, uh, I hope you who have taken criminal law know the difference between murder and felony murder. All right, Victor Stevens could have been convicted of felony murder based on his confessions. His confessions would not support capital murder because basically for capital murder, he'd have to go in the store intending to kill people and then to rob the store. Uh, felony murder is when you're participating in a, in a felony and in the course of that participation, somebody gets killed, whether you do it or somebody else. Um, Victor Stevens did not have a felony murder jury instruction. So one of the grounds that we had challenged in his sentence was that he had had inadequate counsel. The judge actually, over the objections of the defense lawyer, gave a self-defense jury charge. All right? And the only reason that you would give a self-defense jury charge is if you disbelieved the mistaken identity defense that Victor Stevens' lawyer was trying. So even though the self-defense jury charge was given, you did not get the uh, reckless manslaughter jury charge, which was, would be one of the charges between there and capital murder, and you did not get the robbery murder, the felony murder jury charge. And so if you're a jury member and you believe that Victor Stevens is there, you only had two choices, innocence or capital murder. And then once he was sentenced to capital murder, then the judge could override the jury's recommendation of life without parole. All right, I'm going to skip all the way to the, close to the end. Um, this is the order from Judge Grenade, who is in the Southern District of Alabama. 
And this is the 2011, October 6, 2011 order where she awards Victor Stevens a new trial. Um, if you're interested in how those opinions that you read in your casebook originally look, this is the same order as published by Westlaw. Okay, so the, the, what you saw before is the way it appears if you go into the PACER system and pull it up, but, but Westlaw decided this opinion was worth publishing. This is what it looks like. There's one particular, um, quote that I'd like to read to you out of this opinion. This is the page in the opinion, and then I've pulled out the particular part that I want to read, and this is the judge's words. In reviewing all relevant circumstances, in this record, the court finds that it blinks reality to deny that the state struck Ms. Ace Harris and perhaps several other of the black potential jurors because they were African American. The record of this case compels a finding that the state's use of a peremptory strike, in this case to dismiss Ms. S. Harris, constituted intentional discrimination and violated Stevens' right under the Equal Protection Clause in the clearly established law as determined by the Supreme Court in Batson. So the, the, the evidence on the other jurors, she didn't make a finding on. For Batson, you only had to find that they discriminatorily struck one juror. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Harris was one of the ones who they had written okay. Her nephew was a state trooper, which the state admitted would be somebody that they'd won on the jury. They struck her because she had Ken's people who had been in criminal trouble. Um, what happened is that as we, in that two month window between when I started working on the case and when we actually had the Rule 32 hearing, one of the things we did is we interviewed all the jurors. We found four of the jurors who, who told us that the reason that the state struck them was not true. We subpoenaed all four of those jurors to come to the Rule 32 hearing. Um, only two of them showed up. So recognize the, the fear of law enforcement in a, in a community of that size, two of the jurors, even though they were under subpoena, would not come and testify at the Rule 32 hearing. Uh, Sarah Harris and um, the, Gracie Lewis, the two who did show up, testified that the reasons that were given for them having been struck were not true. Now, under Batson, you're not supposed to use off-the-record information. They used off-the-record information to strike nine of the jurors, four of whom I was able to figure out was wrong, the other jurors wouldn't talk to us. Two of those four wouldn't come to the Rule 32 hearing. But when we showed to Judge Miggs that two of the reasons that they had used to strike jurors were wrong, that's when we got the strike sheets with the S's and the things written on them. They, those were protected as work product. But Judge Miggs, in light of the testimony from the two jurors that the reasons they had given us were false, forced the state to produce the attorney work product which is where we get the S's and the OK's and all the need reason to strike evidence that was added. Now, just another sort of side story that sort of fits in with that. At the appeal of the Rule 32 hearing, if you had been sitting there listening to the arguments, you would think that Victor Stevens was going to be awarded a new trial by the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals based on the questions that were asked. And as we left the proceeding, uh, 12 people who were from the victim's families had been sitting there. So the state, in order to put pressure on the elected Alabama Court of Criminal Appeal judges, called the victim's families and had 12 family members there in the, in the hearing room while we were having our oral argument. And I leave, and the three, three of the male family members of the victims hotbox me. And I'm sitting there, and they're asking me questions that are uh, not asking, more asking about my heritage and my family in terms of uh, and where I might like to have things placed in my body. And um, I give the Assistant Attorney General credit because he didn't need to, but he actually intervened and made those family members leave me alone. But part of what this is, is look, I understand those victims' family members' emotions about this, right? This was a crime, and their family members were killed, and they saw Victor Stevens as having been the person who was responsible. And it just goes to show how the emotion and all gets so involved here. You know, you've, you've You've got to be able to step back and look at the thing, and the justice system has to work properly. I don't care whether you're a prosecutor, whether you're defending people. Um, now, the last thing I want to read you is, um, is this letter that was written to me by Victor Stevens in, in, in September 10th, 2006. So 
I'm reading this. I took out the parts that uh, were privileged, you know, that were, were, were communications about the case. But I think it's helpful if I will read to y'all the parts of this that um, will help you think about is Victor Stevens somebody who we ought to be executing? So when I was much younger, so many years ago, it was hard for people to put and have faith in me because I was born with a hard head. And I once lived by my own rules in this world. My greed and so-called pride kept me believing that I could be bad and that I didn't need God, friends, and people in my life. But the truth is, I was lost and living in a self-made prison of lies, easy money, drugs, and sex, a prison much stronger and more debilitating than the kind of a prison I'm in now. Now, the real question isn't why am I on death row, but ra rather, why am I still alive and not dead today? I was so close to death and hell so many years ago, you could smell the smoke on me. But God, you, and my family had mercy and love for me, snatched me, yes, snatched me away from that destiny. So I no longer live that life, and that's why I'm going to pay you back, because it feels good when people have some faith in you. And that's the thing about faith. If you don't have it, you can't understand it. And if you do, no explanation is necessary, right? Thanks for having some faith in me. And tell your family that I said hi. And all is well for me. And I pray that it's the same for you and your family, Mr. C. All right. Um, you know... Some people would think that someone who was in Victor Stevens' situation couldn't be redeemed, that his soul had no value. And um, I have great sympathy for the family members of the victims and for the victims. And, you know, there are things that need to be done to protect society. But when you read, when you read what Victor Stevens is able to write, then you have to ask yourself, do we need to kill this person? Are we going to teach other people not to commit murders by murdering Victor Stevens as he is today. Um, now, I want to step back for just a second and talk to you a little bit about why you're a lawyer. This is going to take just a minute. You know, being a lawyer is a profession. You have a license to help other people solve their problems. It's a calling. It's a calling in the same way being a minister or a physician is a calling. And, you know, your objective is to serve your clients and to help them with whatever their problems are. And part of the reason why I encourage you to do pro bono work is it forces you to focus on that aspect of serving when you're a lawyer. And it reminds you that it is a calling. And it is something that you need to do as a lawyer with every client, whether they're paying you or whether it's a pro bono client, whether you're working in the prosecutor's office or whether you're working at a public defender's office, whatever you're doing. And so one thing I would like to leave you all with and encourage you is when you go through your life, remember that when you're working as a lawyer, you have a privilege that's been granted to you by the state to help other people with their problems, and I encourage you to take on pro bono work because that will help you remember that that's part of what you're doing when you're working as a lawyer. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.